So thank you for having me here. As he told you, I provide technical assistance to community groups. And I've been dealing with oil field waste and oil and gas drilling and production activities since the 1970s, helping the citizens understand what is going on in their communities so that they can make decisions on what they want to happen in their community. So I'd like to tell you just a little bit about the oil and gas waste issues and how they are regulated. The first thing is that that waste is non-hazardous. And if you talk to anyone in the industry, they'll tell you over and over again, our waste is non-hazardous. It's from the drilling and production activities. The Solid Waste Disposal Act of 1980 prohibited EPA from regulating drilling fluids, produced water, and other waste associated with exploration, development, and production of crude oil and natural gas as RICRA or hazardous waste. Backing up, that produced water is what has also captured the flowback water that we'll be talking about in a little while. So it prohibited EPA from regulating it as hazardous. Therefore, oil and gas goes under the non-hazardous waste issues. And it's combined into a large volume waste, which is produced water, drilling fluids, and drilling cuttings. And backing up, produced water now includes flowback water. And it's non-hazardous, but if you analyze it, 10 to 70% of it analyzes as hazardous. So if you're in the industry, if you're in the refining industry or the petrochemical industry, or you manufacture hazardous material, you know that you analyze it, and if it meets a certain criteria, it's hazardous and has to be handled and disposed of as hazardous. But because of that exemption, it's non-hazardous. So 10 to 70 percent is hazardous if you analyze. And then there's the associated waste, which is completion fluids, production storage tank sludges, oil and sand and solids, pit sludges, and wastewater from tank cleaning facilities. And again, it's not hazardous, but if you analyze it, 40 to 60 percent analyzes as hazardous, but quote, it continues to be non-hazardous. So then, a number of years ago, the shale gas development started in the United States as well as a number of foreign countries. Shale gas is a, shale is a formation that's very deep that has a lot of natural gas in it and in the Eagle Fort it has a lot of oil in it. Very deep meant it was too expensive to spend the money to drill the wells when natural gas prices were very low. The industry knew it was there. They did all the seismic testing, not an issue. It was just too deep and too expensive to go after. Natural gas prices went up, and it became more economically viable to go after this deep shale formation of gas. Today, we have natural gas prices down almost to nothing. But the gas industry has the leases on this property, and they have so many years to drill the well, or else they lose the lease. So they are being forced to go out and drill the wells, and in a lot of cases, they're not having to produce the wells, but shutting the wells to comply with the lease requirements. And it has gotten to the point that there is so much excess natural gas that the liquefied natural gas import facilities, and in Louisiana we have two and a number of additional ones that have been proposed. You have one here in Texas, right on the Sabine River, on the border of Louisiana and Texas. And the one on the Sabine River has actually uh, proposed and has been awarded a contract to export the gas. So all of this natural gas that is being produced in excess will then be exported to foreign countries. So when you hear at the national level, we want to be energy independent, Suddenly, we are looking at exporting a large amount of this natural gas that comes from the shale gas development. So this hydraulic fracturing fluids are used to frack each well and contain 60 to 160 tons of chemicals. So this is the fracturing fluid that once it goes down the well and fracks open the formation, when it comes back, 
It's called flowback fluid, and it's now in the same category as produced water, non-hazardous, but it contains 60 to 160 tons of chemicals. And here are some of the chemicals, surfactants, lauryl sulfate. The industry will tell you, oh, it's just like Dawn dishwashing detergent. Friction reduces to make that material go down the well and not impact the casing very much and go into the formation. Then you have biocides to kill the bacteria. And so these are some of the chemicals that are in the biocides. And it's to pasteurize, not sterilize, but kill the organisms so they don't start building up on all of the tubing and the packers and all. Scale inhibitors, so it's ethylene glycol and a lot of number of acid chemicals to stop the scale from building up on the piping. Corrosion inhibitors, and here you see some of the chemicals. Iron control, breakers, and then there's propping agent. So once you go in and fracture this very dense formation, you have to keep it open so that the gas can flow back. So you put an agent to prop it open, prop, prop the cracks open. For the most part, it's sand, and the sand particles go in and hold it open. In Louisiana and New Iberia, we have a facility that makes what they call ceramic propping agents, which are ceramic beads with a large number of very toxic heavy metals. So if they move from just sand to these ceramic beads, then you have this other source of contamination in the formation. So then we look at flow back. It goes down and under pressure, cracks open the formations, props it open with sand or ceramic, and then some of the material flows back to the surface, along with the natural gas that's flowing through these cracks. And the flow back material has contaminated with things in the formation and also with naturally occurring radioactive material such as radium-226. In the Marcellus and the Barnett shale, from 20% to 100% in the Eagle Ford shale of the flow back water is estimated to remain underground. So in the Eagle Ford, uh, almost 100% stays underground with all of those chemicals in them. Marcellus and Barnett, about 20 stays underground. Some of it comes back over time. So this produced water is what we usually call produced water and normal oil and gas activity. It has a lot of salt. It has a lot of volatile organic chemicals, benzene, non human cancer carcinogen, ethyl benzene, toluene, semi-volatiles such as phenol, pyridine, which are known and suspected to cause cancer, birth defects, genetic impacts, a whole host of toxic heavy metals. So the produced water then starts coming to the surface when the gas starts coming to the surface and the entire time gas is being produced, you're also producing large quantities of produced water. The produced water is contaminated with those materials I just showed you, <coughs> sulfur compounds, the naturally occurring radioactivity 226, radium 228, uranium, salt water. The volatile chemicals and the toxic heavy metals are known and possible cancer causing agents. The radium is a bone seeker. It's a known cancer causing agent and it causes lung and bone cancer. So now that we have all these chemicals that we're put in the environment, we put it down the well, some of it's come back, it's in tanks on the site, it's being released. Let's look at how people in the area of shale gas development are being exposed. Inhalation and dermal exposure and absorption from the air emission. If any of you have been to the community of dish, you smell it, you taste it, you're being exposed, you're inhaling it, and then when it touches your skin, you're exposed. The natural gas produced is methane and its associated hydrocarbons and condensates. The condensate contains extremely toxic volatile chemicals. Benzene, known as an cancer causing agent, causes leukemia in children. Xylene, toluene, ethyl benzene, other possible cancer causing agents and the sulfur-based compounds, so that results in the rotten egg smell. These chemicals are released into the air during production, during the separation process, from tank storage, and from pipeline transportation. So let's just say you don't have a well in your backyard or near you,
but the pipeline suddenly is coming through your yard. And the pipeline stations or compressor stations along the pipelines are sources of this air emission. So you don't have to be right by a well, right by the pad. You can be by some of the other infrastructure that is required in order for these wells to produce and get the natural gas to market. Headways of exposure start with the emissions into the air from produced water tanks on the production sites. So when we start talking a little later about the ordinances you're putting in, you need to be asking where are the produced water tanks going to be on the site? And will they have vapor recovery systems or will they vent into the air? The toxic volatile organic chemicals and the sulfur compounds come out of these water tanks. The natural gas is vented to the air especially when you do the first well on a pad, you don't put in the pipeline because you want to be sure you're going to hit. So the first well is put in, it's fracked, and nitro gas starts flowing to the surface, and you don't have a pipeline to put it in to take it for distribution, so you vent it into the air or you flare it. And so the people living in the area around are inhaling the methane and all the associated chemicals that go with the natural gas production. The compressors and the motors on the drilling site and production sites, huge quantities of emissions come from those. Injection wells where the waste is disposed of. And we in Louisiana have shale gas along the northern part near Shreveport, along I-20. And we send all of our flow back and produce water to you in Texas because we don't have a good formation to inject it in. And Texas is more than happy to have it because that's an economic bonus to the state. You look at all of the hydrocarbons that degrade the air quality. The people that live in these communities have their quality of life degraded substantially. The combustion products also combine with the volatile organic chemicals in the presence of heat and sunlight to produce ground level ozone. And a lot of these areas in this area of Texas are an ozone non-attainment. And you talk about autos as a source of ozone. You talk about the refineries and the petrochemical plants. But very little discussion about the production and drilling sites that cause emissions into the air that combine and cause ozone. Out west, we have huge ozone non-attainment areas during the middle of winter from the oil and gas drilling and production. So that's another thing, if you're very sensitive, you have respiratory problems, suddenly you find you have having ozone elevated levels in your community, and you're breathing real hard, and you've got these a rattly chest, and you're, you're feeling that you just can't make it to the next room. That's the ozone as associated with this. So then we look at another pathway of exposure is ingestion and dermal absorption. You're going to eat it. Groundwater, surface water, you're going to drink it. When those resources are contaminated, you ingest it. You also take a bath or a shower, so you have the dermal exposure. The, I've been working in Pavilion, Wyoming. They have contaminated groundwater. And the Agency for Toxic Substance, in cooperation with the Environmental Protection Agency, said that they had so much toxins and methane in their water that when they washed clothes or ran the dishwasher, or wash dishes, or took a shower, or took a bath, they needed to vent, either open the window or put the vent fan on because it was an explosive situation and a toxic situation. So what you don't want is to live in an explosive or a toxic situation as a result of shale gas development. So then you have spills and leaks from pits, tanks, rigs, chemical storage containers, drums, flow lines, pipelines, mixing vats, trucks, and injection lines. This all comes to you as a result of shale gas smell. And the industry admits that they have a huge number of spills and leaks. And those spills and leaks contaminate surface water resources and shallow groundwater resources. So there will be pads that will be contaminated for a very long time just based on the spills and the leaks that occur. And in some states, road spreading is allowed to keep the dust down. And what you want to be sure of is when you're on a haul road or near a haul road that all these trucks are going into the shale gas development, you want to be sure that they're not wetting down that road with produced water. 
you want to ensure they're wetting down that road with clean water. If not, you're going to be exposed to that method. And then you have untreated and improperly treated produced water and flow baths going into wastewater treatment plants. The city of Pittsburgh uses the water from the river for drinking. Up above Pittsburgh, a number of wastewater sewer treatment plants took flow bath water and were paid to take it. And the treatment of the sewer plant had no impact of on the flow back and the produced water. It may be coming back to your community at your faucet. So here are the acute health impacts. Acute means short term right away. You're exposed to it. You start reacting. That are experienced by people living in close proximity to shale gas, drilling, fracturing, produced waters. And this is produced wells. And this is the air pathway. Irritation to the skin, eyes, nose, throat, and mouth. Headaches, dizziness, light, nausea, vomiting, skin rashes, fatigue, tension and nerves, personality changes, depression and anxiety, irritability, confusion, drowsiness, weakness, muscle cramps, irregular heartbeat. So if tomorrow you had that have one of those health impacts and you live near shale gas development, you would go to your doctor and would you tell him where you live and would you tell him what chemicals you may be exposed to, or would you just go in for treatment for your symptoms? And would the doctor ask you the questions, what have you been exposed to, where do you live, or will the doctor merely treat you for the symptom? That becomes an issue. Most of the medical physicians are not equipped to deal with toxic exposure, and frequently they just try and treat the symptom and don't ask what is causing the symptom, where it may have come from, and what are the results of it. So these types of health symptoms can visit your neighborhood. Yesterday, Sharon and I met with TCEQ and the Environmental Protection Agency over the community members living around Barger Health Center, which is a facility that takes and produce water and separates it from the natural gas and puts the natural gas in the Mockingbird pipeline and then stores the natural gas on site. The air emissions from that facility are impacting the citizens living all around it. They can tell you which way it's worse when the wind blows in which direction. And their stories of all their health impacts are just absolutely heartbreaking. They lived there way before the facility was constructed. It went online in October of 2010. Their whole quality of life is just, just totally destroyed. Their health impacts are severe and ongoing. And right now, they have no choice either to live there or walk away from the investment they have and try to make a new start. So then chronic long-term exposure. Let me just tell you that they frack a well, and it may take a couple of weeks, may take a little less, and then they put a number of wells on the pad. So over a year's period, they're continuing to frack the new wells on the pad. Production decreases something like 80% in the first year, gas production. So at that time, they usually have to come back in and start fracking again. So they will be fracking all the wells that they did the initial follow-up frack. So when they tell you, oh, well, we'll just be out here a couple of months, and then it's just going to be a Christmas tree or a structures that won't impact you. They're going to be there a long time. So we're talking chronic exposure, long-term exposure. Damage to the liver and the kidneys, the lungs, the nervous system causing weakness, leukemia, aplastic anemia, changes in blood cells, impacts to the blood clotting mechanism. When I did some health surveys, and this is one that I did in the community of DISH, I did air sampling, correlated the chemicals in the air with their health impacts, did health surveys of the community, and correlated the health impacts that were being experienced by the community back with the chemicals that were being released into the air. The most prevalent was respiratory impacts. 81% of the people surveyed had respiratory impacts. Memory loss, 56%. We're experiencing a lot of people with memory loss as a result of the BP spill. But the interesting thing is that if you interview one person in a family that has memory loss, they won't tell you. But if you interview the spouse, she'll go like, every time I ask him to do something, he never remembers. 
So you know what we started doing? Writing notes. And the whole house is plastered with notes so he can look at the notes and see what I asked him to do. But you don't hear that when you, the patients go into the doctor because they don't know that they're having memory loss and the spouse is the one that recognizes it the most. So here we have feelings of weak and tired, throat irritation, sinus problems, high blood pressure, muscle aches and pains, forgetfulness, recall problems, breathing difficulties, eye burning, joint pain, decreasing vision, sleep disorder. So if you come down with any one or number of these health symptoms and you go to the doctor, is the doctor going to ask you what you're being exposed to? Are you going to tell the doctor immediately what you think you're being exposed to based on where you live or where you work or where you go to school or where your children go to school. All of this is very important for the community to know and understand so you can understand the whole situation and react appropriately. So health impacts experienced by individuals living in close proximity to shale gas. 25% of the individuals surveyed had the following Nasal irritation, arthritis, persistent indigestion, increased fatigue, frequent urination, extreme drowsiness. 25% of the individuals had difficulty in concentrating, inability to recall numbers, ringing in the ears, difficulty hearing, severe headaches, tingling in the hands, reduced muscle strength, loss of sexual drive, and people don't talk about that. So let's look at the health impacts reported by communities members living 50 feet to 2 miles. And over and over again, I've been doing interviews since I've been here for the last couple of days, and a lot of the people ask, well, how far of a setback should we have? Well, these are the health impacts that are reported from people living from 50 feet to 2 miles. So this says that 2 miles is not enough. Out of 2 miles, we're still getting impacts. 61% of the health impacts associated with chemicals presenting excess of short and long-term health impacts. That means TCEQ has limits, and the air emissions at these facilities that we monitor, 61% of those emission chemicals were over TCEQ's accepted level. Those 61% over TCEQ's accepted levels are the ones with the extra. Nasal irritation, throat irritation, eyes burning, frequent nausea, sinus problems, bronchitis, and it goes on and on and on. So the chemicals are there, there are known health impacts, and that's the health impacts the citizens are being experienced. And when you ask the citizens about odor and symptom events, they say they occur on a frequent basis. So you have a normal level of emissions going on, and then you have an upset condition, or you lose electricity and the compressor stops and restarts. And so those are events, or odor events. So on top of the normal emissions, then you have those other peak events. It goes on, weakness and tiredness, ringing in the ears, depression, falling, staggering, severe anxiety, lesions on the skin. So these health symptoms are real. These are being experienced by people in the shale gas area. These are not made up health impacts. These are really being experienced by the people in the area. So when we look at the most prevalent medical conditions for individuals living in close proximity to compressor stations and metering stations, these are along pipelines. These are not at the wellhead. These are along pipelines. And you may have a compressor station that springs up in your neighborhood because of a well pad further away. So when you look at the compressor station and metering station, the medical conditions, 71% have respiratory impacts. 58% have sinus. 55 have throat, allergies, weakness, and fatigue. 52 have eye irritation. And it goes on. 48% has nasal. 45 has joint pain. 42 has muscle aches. All the way down to 39 with severe headaches. Sleep disturbance, swollen and painful joints. Does this sound like a condition that you would like to live in with these kind of health impacts? These are the things that you need to know what's going on so you can try and protect your health and the health of your neighbors and your children and your family. So when we look at the compressor station and the gas metering stations, what do they have as units that release emissions into the air? They have the compressor engines, 
the compressor blow down, the condensate tanks. And if those condensates don't have any <coughs> recovery, everything is vented into the air. They have storage tanks. Then they have truck loading racks, where the trucks come in and take the heavily concentrated condensates off-site in their trucks. They have black hog dehydration units, which release huge quantities of benzene. And in a lot of the states that have oil and gas facilities, along gas pipelines, they have black hog dehydration units, and we have clusters of leukemia near those black hog dehydration units because of the release of benzene into the air. We have amine units that are used to clean up the gas. We have separators, and then we have just fugitive emissions. Everywhere where there's a joint or a flange, it leaks. From the day they put it in, it leaks. And as it wears, it leaks more and more. So when you see pipes and connectors, you have to remember every one of those at the joint leaks. So 90% of the individuals report experiencing odor events from these facilities. 90% of the community report odor events. So then we look at the health effects experienced by community members living near a natural gas storage and processing tank form. <coughs> Acute health effects, the same ones you hear, irritated skin, eyes, nose, mouth, throat, and lungs, headache, dizziness, light headedness, nausea, vomiting, and the chronic or long-term anemia, cancer, and leukemia. So that does not speak well for the long-term exposure of the people living near these types of facilities. So then we look at groundwater, chemicals that are detected in the water associated with shale gas. And a lot of discussion has been going on about groundwater contamination. So these are the chemicals that have been detected in groundwater as a result related that to shale gas drilling, production, and distribution. The petroleum hydrocarbons, the chlorides, the nitrates, 2 butoxyphosphate dimethylphosphate, methane, fluoride, nitrate, arsenic, bisphenol A. All of these chemicals we determined as a result of groundwater contamination. What are the chemicals detected in the air from shale gas drilling production? Number one, benzene, known human cancer causing agent. One, three, butadiene, whole host of disulfide and sulfur compounds. <coughs> ethyl benzene, ethyl benzene, ethylene, ethylene oxide, Naphthalene, known and suspected cancer-causing agents, genetic impacts, chronic exposure chemicals. All of these have been detected in the air. So the chemicals detected in the air with shale gas filling and production, xylene, ethyl, ethane, isobutane, methane, it goes on and on and again, it's sulfur dioxide. I spent last week in a community in Arkansas that lived near a paper mill that had huge quantities of sulfur dioxide released into the air. And in the week I was there, the wind changed a number of times based on the weather fronts, and different parts of the community were being exposed based on the wind. The sulfur dioxide is very heavy, very dense, sinks down, moves into people's houses, and when the wind is really, really strong, it moves because it's very, very heavy and takes wind to transport it. So what happens in the community when proposed shale gas. Some of the local cities or counties, or as in Louisiana parishes, decide they want to do something. So you saw the exemption at the federal level that the states could not regulate it as oil field waste as hazardous. So there are a few overarching programs at the federal level, but most of the regulation of drilling and production is in the state. Often, these, in Texas, it's the Railroad Commission. It's usually the Conservation Commissions in states. Their number one, number one authority is to develop the resource. They are there to grant permits to develop the oil and the gas resources. And as a side issue, they deal with regulating the activity and looking out for what needs to be on the books to deal with the drilling and the waste. In the case of shale gas, it came on really fast because the price of natural gas went up. As a result, the states were just hit with huge numbers of applications for permits. 
they started taking the field staff and bringing them into the central office to review and write permits. There was few people left out in the field to do inspections and enforcement. And the more the shale gas grew, grew, the more people you needed writing permits and the fewer people you had in the field doing enforcement and inspections. And in Texas, it's still that way. <coughs> if you're going to do it appropriately, you need enough people to do appropriate review of the permit applications, not review them in 10 minutes and sign off. And you definitely need people in the field enforcing the regulation. But at the local level, you cannot regulate how the drilling is done. You can regulate how the activity impacts you in the community. You can regulate siting, you can set back requirements, zoning. So that if you want to develop some ordinances, you can say you can't put a well within X number of feet of a home, a church, a school, a hospital. You can do things like, I encourage when they're developing ordinances that you need to ask for the full picture. You don't want to say, apply for one well on this pad and the city or the county grants a permit. That city or county needs to say how many wells are going to be on that pad, where they're going to be located, where the compressors are going to be, how far the compressors are going to be from everything. Will there be a pit? What kind of water are you going to use for this fracking fluid? Because once you use this water in fracking, it's wasted from the water cycle forever. Where are you going to dispose of this water? Where are the haul roads? Where are the pipelines going? So that you may not have the well at your house, but he may have the pipeline going through his front yard or his backyard. And so he has a right to know that if the city or the county grants a permit for that well, that he's going to be getting the pipeline in future. All of those things need to be available to the city or the county when they make a decision whether or not to grant a permit for that well. So what happens when you come up with a good set of ordinances? You have a, a requirement that you can apply for a variance. So a gas company comes in and they apply for 20 variances with the permit. And so the community gets out there and gets involved and testifies in the public hearing. And the zoning committee or the council decides to only grant two of the variances and not the others. And they decide to grant the permit for the well minus all those variances. The gas company comes back and says, we're going to sue you for the variances you didn't grant. So then the legal division of the governmental agency goes like, we don't have the resources to defend a suit like that. We're stretched with our budgets and all this. So then suddenly it's turned around and the variances are granted. And then that sends a message to all the other cities or counties that even if you have a variance provision, you're going to have to give all those variances, or you're going to wind up spending a large part of the city or county's budget in court. And then the people in the community are not going to be happy because they don't get the services they expect because the money's going. So even if you have the best set ordinance in place, you have to be very much aware that these variances can drive the ordinance in the ground and can have the impact of having the, the ordinance itself have little strength because the variances will come in and get rid of all the good issues that you developed as part of the ordinances. Okay. So can we take questions? Yeah. talking about how bad it's going to hurt us and what chemicals there are. The deal is, is that uh, why are we talking to the gas companies about how they should make their wells safe? Uh, you can present any recommendations about how you make wells drilling, fracking safe. Why, why did you not? You, you make, you make the uh, wells safer and you make the process safer by implementing regulations at the state level. 
We, I'm not talking about laws and regulations. I'm talking about digging the things and how you build them so they don't have all this blowback, etc. And you keep the crap down below an impermeable layer where it won't hit the groundwater at 1,000 feet. The technology is such right now that you use the fracking fluid to go down and do the fracture. Some of it comes back, some of it doesn't. When they fracture frequently, it goes out of the zone that they were in. Well, then we, we need to improve the, how you drill it, not how you deal with how, what you bring back up. If we keep it down there, it would seem, then we wouldn't the have an issue. The industry will only improve technology based on pressure from the community. That's the problem. And the community has to be willing to bring that pressure. And the communities that are already suffering as a result of the impacts of this are the ones who have the first-hand information about what's going on in their communities. Well, is it the real issue that Vice President Cheney precluded the uh, drilling companies, the fracking companies, from releasing the chemicals and what's going down into the, into the Correct. wells? Correct. Isn't so that a big deal here? That was a big deal that we can't still find is. out what chemicals. And, and I do another presentation of there's a need for groundwater monitoring before pad is started. So we know what's there before. We need to know what chemicals are used on that pad, and then we need to do monitoring long term. And the industry's not happy with, with that as well. Aren't they, aren't they in New York and uh, Pennsylvania now that they're starting to frack up in those areas, developing good drilling procedures to keep the stuff down? Very slowly, yes. And I've, I've been reviewing them because I've, I've been working in those things. Oh, yes.